Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Tom Graber, really a long, lifelong friend of mine, at least professionally anyway. Uh, Tom, thank you very much for coming to Ann Arbor today. My pleasure to be here, and I would say we're lifelong friends personally as well as professionally. That's true, with your son being my daughter's god, godfather, I guess that... And a that, student of yours, right, and an so. associate in practice, so we've had right. a long familial relationship. Right. Well, it's, it's a... It's a very great pleasure for me to have Tom here today. We're going to talk about chin cup therapy, but uh, tonight uh, will be the formal announcement of Tom Graber being the first person in the history of the University of Michigan's 175 years plus 175 years of uh, receiving an honorary degree, which will be granted in December. And so I congratulate you, and I think this is going to be, uh, should be a very fun day for you, and also in December it certainly should be a very good time. So congratulations. Thank you. I'm mindful of the honor. I appreciate it, and I'm happy to do whatever I can to try to live up to the uh, to the award. Well, you already have done that. That's not a problem. We uh, have talked. You and I have talked about for many many years about orthopedics, and certainly perhaps you more than anyone got me interested in the wide variety of orthopedic appliances and the one thing that certainly you have had a great uh, influence on the profession is the use of chin cups. Uh, over the years we've seen the Frankel appliance, the FR3, the uh, orthopedic facial mask and the chin cup perhaps being three of the most commonly used types of appliances for uh, class 3 malocclusion. Can you give us a little bit of history on how the chin cup came about and how you personally got involved in this kind of treatment? Actually, I was fortunate enough in practice to practice with Fred Noyes. He was 80 when I went in there as getting out of graduate school at, at 30, and he was telling me many times of what Edward H. Angle did and what the, his predecessors did. And in the, one of the things he required was that we read history. And so very early, we found out that uh, people with the so-called Hopsburg jaw, the lantern jaw sticking out in the middle of the room, they were trying to control this. And actually as early as 1850 or 1860, there were crude devices where they had head caps. And in Angle's uh, seventh edition, you have this classic picture of a net head cap fits over the head with the uh, elastics coming down and a chin cap. So the idea of using a chin cap certainly is not new. Uh, for me, uh, my initiation, of course, after the historical part was I did my doctorate in cleft lip and palate, and they had these cases of mismatch of maxilla and mandible. Actually, most of them were maxillary uh, deficiencies, but we had this strong mandibular prognathism or, or pseudoprognathism in most of these class, uh, in the, most of these cleft cases, and we had to find some way to adjust the mandible to the retruded maxilla. And so we, we were desperately looking for orthopedic force, of course, and for uh, dental, a combination of dental and orthopedic response to correct the sagittal malrelationship, the protrusion of the mandible and the relative re retrusion of the, of the maxilla. And so we turned originally to chin caps in our, and I was very active in clinically treating these cleft palate cases. At one time during my PhD from 47 to 50, over 50% 50 of my cases were cleft palate. And it was a very disappointing thing to see us put braces on, and noise would have them on for years, and he, uh, pulling the uh, upper incisors forward and the lower incisors back, and we never finished our cases. And so I was disappointed with that, and I wanted to find something a little bit more than a dental answer to the uh, uh, problem of, of the skeletal malrelationship that we was had. It, was anyone teaching chin cup therapy at that time? You know, actually not. Uh, it was passe, it was Angle 7th edition, they weren't using it at Illinois, the font of higher Angle learning, uh, where everything was, uh, where they worshipped Angle. They, that was one thing they didn't pick up. So actually the tin cap was, was not being taught. So how did you come point. about uh, using this kind of appliance? Well, I just felt that we had to do something beyond putting on uh, braces on teeth to straighten teeth to get rid of the sagittal malrelationship. And I thought that some of the early work, that it would work, I uh, 
was in the hospital there, I was with the orthopedic department, I watched them guide long bones, the growth of, of crooked arms, I watched them putting on splints, putting on force, and straightening spine, straightening long bones, and I thought, well, if it works for uh, endochondral bone, certainly membranous bone is more responsive, and it should work for membranous bone, and that was the rationale for it. Now, how long, uh, you've obviously used chin cups then for 30 or 40 or however many years, a long time anyway. What kind of uh, cases now, if you were to look at a sample of class three individuals, what types of patients would be most or would benefit most from this kind of treatment? Well, the really, we learned by many mistakes, of course, and we were overly optimistic about the results, and some of our results were partial. Later on, there was some retrogression, so it's not a, a be-all and end-all, and we learned that there are strict limitations on what chin caps can do and, and can't do. We learn more about diagnosis, and not just treating everything as a mandibular prognathism, but the cases now that respond best are the ones where there isn't a really severe familial hereditary pattern case uh, where you have a fighting against a hereditary pattern. Uh, you, we have a mild problem, a mild to moderate problem. There are cases where uh, you have early uh, cr anterior crossbite, where the mandible is lower incisors or forward, and you have the condyle being brought forward out of the fossa, the mandible actually restricting the maxilla as it wants to drop back and you have an activator effect like a Frankel FR3 or a, 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 an activator treating a class three. And so you must get in, what do you need to do? You need to get in early at eight, I've done this on 18 months of age, two years of age, and we have one family, he's a dentist in our building in Kenilworth. He had nine children, the mother was a class three and every single one wore a chin cap. Really? Only two of them wore appliances, and every one of it works. We started at 18 months to two years. This is Dick Lammermeyer, all mm -hmm. his kids. And so they were wonderful patients because he was a Prussian perfectionist, and he saw that those kids wore those chin caps. And so there's no question that getting in early and doing what you have to do, you can uh, improve uh, the sagittal malrelationship. Uh, if you were going to start, uh, let's say, on a mixed dentition patient, uh, someone well, maybe even late deciduous dentition. What kind of protocol would you tell the patient and the parent to follow? Well, first of all, mixed dentition, late mixed dentition, unless they're mild problems, is probably a very limited in what it's going to do. And remember now, we're just talking about chin cap only and right. nothing against the maxilla. There probably uh, isn't that we didn't do it. We did uh, do it in those cases, in our cleft cases and otherwise, in other cases too. Well, we would tell them they'd have to wear a chin cap uh, 14, 12 to 14 hours a day and at night, uh, largely in around the house. And uh, we didn't have them wear them to school. Uh, probably if we had done that, we'd have had obviously more uh, controlling effect on the, on the mandible. But uh, as it was, why we would get certain untoward effects, like some soreness on the chin, particularly in, in uh, redheads and bl blondes who are more susceptible to the chin cap and the perspiration and whatnot. So we'd have them wear it, if it was a mild problem, uh, uh, 12, 14, if we get 16 hours a day. And uh, we'd check them you know, every uh, six to eight weeks. What would you say the ideal time to see, if you have, let's say, sort of a garden variety class three, I'm not talking someone who's very severe. What would you say, the, if you had a general dentist say to you, when would you, ref would you like to see these patients? When would you like to see them? I want to see these kids at two and a half years of age, and no later. Those are our greatest successes. In the same way, and I can show this whole family, there's no question. I learned by making mistakes and the experience of treating early that growth guidance literally must guide growth and prevent the deleterious effects of adverse reaction by having an activator effect on the mandible. Because what happens in these cases, as the mandible is brought forward, it isn't that you enhance the growth that, the growth that much, but you change the direction of growth. And the condyle grows upward and backward as Lyle Johnson says, you unload the condyle, and then the condyle tends to grow backward into the fossa, as it does with activator cases. And when you do that, it perpetuates the mandible in a forward position. And particularly with crossbite cases, unilateral cases, as Edgar Mark Erickson and, and T. Lander have shown, there's no question that you get an activator effect from class three unilateral and bilateral. 
you know, the study, three to 21 years of age, that they did, and it showed, no question about it, an enhancement of the prognathism. So I think you'd want to get in early. In a long, t long answer, but I think the earlier the better, the more, and you may have to go, and th that doesn't mean you're done then. Now, we had to go back on in, in many of these cases again in the mixed dentition. So in answer to that, that's a second assault on the problem. And finally, in the permanent dentition, and, and, and we would also in mixed dentition uh, use uh, palatal expansion in these cases, by the way. We would do, not only use a chin cap, we would use an upper removable appliance with a jack screw in the center, and we would expand the upper arch. Because in many of these cases, the maxillary, as we found out, the maxilla w was deficient in width and we would use a palatal expansion appliance uh, in conjunction with a chin cap. So the chin cap by itself uh, is, is only one approach to it. We needed other appliances. Now in the early 70s, uh, Jean Delaire from France popularized and further developed the face mask, the orthopedic face mask, and Henri Petit has come on since then. How does that fit into your concept of class three treatment? Well, by that time I had learned that all class threes are not mandibular progs, that there were uh, many of these were maxillary, and particularly in the cleft cases, maxillary deficiency, the uh, sagittal malrelationship relationship or retrusion of the maxilla. So it fit in beautifully when we saw this because we had already uh, realized this prior to this. We would use chin caps and we would put horns, there were little metal horns sticking off the chin cap, and then we'd have rubber bands from that going to the maxillary arch. But it was crude, it was not very efficient, and so the Dallaire mask provided us with an effective means of maxillary protraction using the forehead and the chin as an anchorage, as a, re as a reciprocal anchorage, but also having some retrusive effect on the mandible. And what it does, again, I should point out, when you put pressure on the chin, and Don Woodside pointed this out a long time ago, you tend to auto-rotate the mandible downward and backward. As you do, you move the mandible to a little bit more of, of a retrusive position sagittally. You get eruption of the posterior teeth, and uh, this is good too because in many of these class trees you have a maxillary vertical deficiency as well as a sagittal. It's a three-dimensional thing and a transverse deficiency. So what the chin cap will often do, and the Dallaire mask does, rotates the mandible down a bit, posterior uh, eruption, and brings the maxilla forward. So it's a combination of a three-dimensional assault. That together with the, now I know in your case you use rapid palatal expansion. We did, you follow the same philosophy, only we did it with slow palatal expansion and with gradually turning it, turning the uh, appliance, at, uh, the uh, maxillary removable uh, with the jack screw and the usual key. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the concerns that many practitioners, especially people who have not had any experience with the chin cap, uh, is the issue of TMJ problems. And certainly, if you've been doing this since the 1940s, you have a very long history of experience in, in TMD. And, and w certainly with your current expertise as an expert witness in, in litigation cases involving temporomandibular disorders, you, you obviously have an opinion about the, the efficacy of chin cup in, in this regard. I was with Jack Thompson in practice and in school for five years. Jack Thompson probably alerted us more than anyone as orthodontist to TMJ problems. Jack Thompson would not even use a guide plane on incisors because he felt that might create a TMJ problem. And he was totally unalterably opposed to chin caps. He said this would cre create TMJ problems. In fact, uh, I would say the percentage of cases, a fraction of 1%, we just never ran into the problem. Logically, you would think so. You would think that if you can functionally retrude the mandible with occlusion, with nocturnal parafunctional activity, that a chin cap might emulate that. But in actuality, with chin caps, almost never. Occasionally, we'd have some sore uh, joints. These kids would wear these, overwear them if they wore it uh, uh, with, say, three rubber bands, where they would put six or seven on. And in those cases, why I think it would just tell them to stop wearing it, but we did. And to my knowledge, I cannot remember a single case where we created anything more than a temporary problem with clicking, uh, I can't even recall, crepitus, and some neuromuscular soreness, uh, which goes on uh, anyway with conventional therapy. So it just doesn't happen. And I, I am very much aware of what we can do orthodontically to create TMJ problems. It isn't a simple matter that orthodontics doesn't create. It, we can. I think that the evidence is that 
we as orthodontists must be careful because there are certain types of uh, patients, certain types of problems where we can do it. But with uh, class threes, why I must say with a chin cap and with the Dallara mask, it was not a clinical concern. How much force would you use uh, in a typical chin cap case? We would use somewhere between uh, 15 and 24 ounces on the, with a chin cap. Uh, two to three elastics on the side, and I don't remember the exact measurement of the elastic, between 15, and, and that got me into maxillary orthopedics. That's how I got into it, because as you know, or you, it may, this is history, and, and you may want to know this, the ADA just voted down in New Orleans this past five days ago to change the name of our specialty from orthodontics officially to dental facial orthopedics. We introduced the term, we introduced the concept for what it's worth at that time, and they now, our journal has been, de Journal of Orthodontics, Dental Facial Orthopedics, now we are the specialty of orthodontics and dental facial orthopedics. And I think it depends largely on much of the work we did with the chin cap, the orthopedic effect of growth guidance, and on the use of orthopedic force against the maxilla in class two. So growth guidance is a, is a fact. Well, you've had an uncanny ability over the years to identify new technologies that would be useful, and certainly the area of dental facial orthopedics is one of them, that starting with the chin cap and then going into various types of class two mechanics, uh, you know, I think probably you more than anyone has been responsible. I do know for a fact that you were responsible for the resolution to change this name of the specialty to orthodontics and dental facial orthopedics. That's correct, isn't That's it? That's correct, and we met a lot of opposition, too. Uh, there were a number of people who thought it was wrong that orthodontics, ortho, straight, dons, tooth, describe what we do. Everybody understood that. But, the, but the, uh, those in other phases of dentistry who were not non-specialists in orthodontics adopted the so-called orthopedic concepts without the diagnostic acumen that we have and we need. And it was imperative that we, do, if there was going to be any growth guidance, we were the ones to do it because we know how to, how to do this. I think one fact here that I haven't emphasized, all these cases require very careful diagnosis. You ask what protocol. The protocol, uh, the appliance, but the first thing is a very careful, thorough uh, analysis of the problem. And that means a sagittal, uh, means a, a lateral head films, a good supplementary analysis measuring the, the anterior posterior, the vertical, and an anterior posterior film, the uh, transverse dimensions, the problems that we face so we know where our problems are. And so I, I, unless you have that adequate diagnosis and understanding and knowing growth and development as orthodontists do better than anyone else, then I don't think you should talk about orthopedic force or growth guidance. The mistakes we made in the beginning and that other people make too often are not uh, correlating our knowledge of growth and development and growth guidance. What kind of clinical problems, aside from the redness issue, what other kinds of clinical problems did you run into or have you seen people run into in the past using a chin cup sure. type appliance? The most common one is uh, partial correction, uh, where we didn't get enough and we never knew. Uh, and the fortunate thing, we were relying on, on patient compliance. And you don't really know with a head cap, uh, even with the modern measuring devices that they have, which tell you how much they wear them, these still could be, uh, they could get patients get around. We never knew how much the patients were actually wearing the plant. Was this lack of patient wear? Was it lack of tissue response? But this is partial correction. And there were many of those cases, certainly in the cleft palate cases, I would, it'd be so great in the beginning, I'd get a certain amount of it. Uh, maybe some of it was condylar retropositioning in the fossa, but we would certainly see a, a certain amount of change, and then it would tend to slow down. The second thing, what have we run into? We've run into uh, a re, a, a re uh, a, a, a rebirth of the class three type pattern, a, a, a tendency to return. So in the later we treated the cases, the less successful they were in the long run. So it's fine, we'll correct it early, we get some anterior compensation of the teeth, uh, some widening with the removable appliance. When we got into the mixed dentition, particularly in boys, in the later growing boys, we would have a dominance of the morphogenetic pattern, and if it's class three, they would tend to return to that. Now, you asked about TMJ. Some of those cases later in the end, and I have now the daughter, uh, 19, of one of our, uh, she's a mother's class three. She was class three. We went through this whole routine, and now she's getting some uh, tendency at times of clicking because she has a very, very tight anterior overbite. And she's a stressful young lady. She clenches at night, 
And so I think it's not just the, 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 the anterior relationship, but I think it's also the, the stress, uh, strain, tension uh, release problem she has. But there's no question that partial uh, success, the later you treat, is, is a concern. Have you ever used these kind of appliances in adults? Uh, I tried it, uh, and what I did, uh, and I got some success, I'll tell you what we did. I, I think of one uh, man particularly was a priest with a terrible prognathism. He did, and of course, he, now we always mention surgery. Early we didn't, that if this doesn't work, you're going to be a surgical case, and this is obviously a, a given. But he didn't want to do this, and so what we did, we gave him a chin cap with a downward pull on the chin, and then we gave him vertical elastics between the upper and lower arch to erupt the posterior teeth, and then we use uh, class three elastics. What we were trying to do there is get an auto-rotation of the mandible downward and then get eruption. It helps to do that at night, and then with the elastics, why you're, you're able to, and with an anterior bite plate inside to prevent the posterior teeth from being in inclusion. You understand what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Because they won't do much good unless you have something to keep them from coming together at night. We have used it. Uh, with some success for partial success there. In hi this case, actually worked out pretty well, but we ended up with the lower incisors tipped back at about 80, 79, upper incisors out at about 115, 120, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But with a dental compensation and a jaw position compensation, it was no, there was no orthopedic growth guidance. It was to help in the dental correction. What, uh, let's assume again you have a garden variety type class three, nothing too severe. What is the oldest age that you could get in with uh, some type of, of um, chin cup treatment and be reasonably assured of success? Uh, let's say also given the fact that there's not a m major history of class three. Six to eight, nine years of age. I wouldn't want to go any later than that. If it's a girl, uh, who they mature uh, more uh, earlier, of course, as we know. Uh, so I think you really want to go toward the the younger age. I think patients, uh, one of the things there, patient compliance is also better in these earlier ages. I'm very much impressed with mixed dentition or deciduous dentition. Anything beyond that, our successes have been partial and temporary uh, in, in most instances. We can all show cases where we, we succeeded, but if it's any a real magnitude, I, I think you have to either treat them early or, and know the pattern and know where the hereditary pattern and uh, you have to have a compliant patient, and you have to think in terms also, not just a chin cap, but of the protraction appliance, the maxillary protraction, which is so often necessary in these cases. And no longer do we think only in terms of retruding the mandible. And, and I think it's important to mention, if you, if you want to hear this, I don't think that we really, uh, despite the work of Petrovic, beautiful work showing how he retarded the prechondroblastic glare of, of the rat with pressure of the chin cap and showing the reduction in the thickness of the prechondroblastic glare uh, in the condyle. I think this does not transmit, uh, does not become uh, uh, clinically a, a major factor. I don't think we do a lot of growth retardation. What we do, and I'm convinced I can show this with radiographs, is that we change the direction of growth of the condyle such as it is from upward and backward to upward and forward. And that allows the body of the mandible to drop back a little bit. And I think that's our greatest effect. I do believe we're able, over a long period of time, to actually reduce the prominence of a, of, of a symphysis by flattening. And I've done that and shown that. Uh, that at least helps in the profile, helps in the facial uh, 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 cosmetics. But there, in other words, there is local bone uh, growth guidance. And you know, they, they showed this many years ago. T historically, if you look at the Aztec Indians, Peruvian Indians, and you watch what they've done with membranous bones with binding the head and binding the chin, there's no question that we can change the direction of growth. Whether the amount can be changed that much, I don't know. Are there any other comments that you'd have that you think would be helpful for someone viewing this tape as far as they're getting into class three treatment? What are some of the things that you've learned sort of in the big picture for any, as far as class three is concerned? Again, repeating. See them early. If they go into the hands of somebody else who doesn't recognize the need for early treatment, it's going to be too, too late. You have to recognize that all class threes are not just one dimensional, they're three dimensional. So you must assess the anterior posterior, the transverse, and the vertical uh, problems. And uh, I think that if you recognize that it's not a chin cap alone or a face mask alone, 
you need to get in with other auxiliary uh, appliances and you have to tell these people that in many instances they're going to have to think in terms of full appliances and finally you must say you know we'll do our best we don't want you to go through surgery but the most successful surgery through the years starting with Blair in 1895 has been the Dingman type operation which the Dingman copied VP Blair in St. Louis that's been the most successful in class three so the surgery isn't the worst thing in the world unlike some of the the Fort One cases, so surgery may be a problem. So I think this is the long-term thing, is what we tell them. The earlier we get in, hopefully, the better we can, we can uh, prevent the need for surgery. But if surgery is indeed necessary, really it's quite successful, and uh, uh, they should not be concerned about it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you have had, what, five of your family have gone to U of M, right? Yeah. And yeah. you taught here for many years with Bob Moyers and you taught when, when I was interim chair and when Peter was chair, and so I certainly know that you have a very long association with the University of Michigan, and I'm really glad to, that, that next month we'll be able to formalize that with uh, an honorary doctorate from Michigan. I think that's great. So thanks a lot, Tom. Thank you very much. It's a great honor. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.